it's rethinking the way your organization problem solves, integrating a team approach to challenging issues. Um, I'm Ashley Brown, and uh, my co-presenters today are Marsha Alford, Teddy Claypool, and Sarah Mitchell. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves and our role in this process, and then we'll get to the best part, which is discussing how you can rethink your organization the way it problem solves. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation, but if you would hold your questions to the end, we would really appreciate it. <clears throat> so my name is Ashley Brown, and I am the Government Documents Foundation Collection Librarian. Um, and I've also been the project manager for this project uh, with the Benedum Grant at KCPL. Um, I also lead a monthly virtual book chat for our adult patrons on Facebook. And um, I've worked for KCPL for a little over five years. Um, I recently obtained my MLIS in 2018, um, which is coming up on two years now. Um, and the Benedum grant was only the second grant I've ever written and this the first project like this that I've ever managed. So I understand um, from the point of view of those of you who are unsure um, of ways to rethink problem solving um, in your organization. Um, I've recently been on the other side of that and gone through this process as a first time. So um, I think that we'll have some information that will be good to share with you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Teddy to introduce himself, and we'll just go down the line. Great. Uh, my name is Teddy Claypool. I'm the Automation Manager at Kanawha County Public Library. Uh, all told, I've worked with public libraries and technology for the last 15 years. Uh, I'm also one of the members of our staff that uh, was involved in basically every section and every training uh, moving forward with the, the restructuring and organization that we did. Um, also a member of uh, the chair elect of the customers of Sociodynex, which is the ILS user group. Uh, I'll hand it over to Sarah Mitchell, who's next in my list. Hi, I'm Sarah Mitchell. Um, I am the main library public service manager. Um, one of my roles and duties is um, system wide programming. So that's um, been part of this and also the collection um, part of this grant. And I will pass it off to Marsha. Hello, everyone. My name is Marsha Alford. I'm the Human Resources and Employee Training Manager at the Kanawha County Public Library. Um, I've been here since 2009. Um, my educational background doesn't really match what I'm doing for a living. Um, I didn't grow up wanting to be a Human Resources Manager. Surprise on that, maybe. So some of you may have wanted to be a librarian as you were growing up. I didn't select um, being a Human Resources Manager. Um, I worked for, my background is in aviation technology, travel and tourism. I have also a degree in science. So I'm really kind of an accidental HR manager. Um, working in my first uh, professional job for United Airlines, um, I was given opportunities to volunteer for different teams. And I kept volunteering for HR related teams. And so, so here I am. Um, it turned out I really wanted to work for a service driven organization. Um, I wanted to be a public servant. Um, and so I made my way to KCPL in 2009, and I've never looked back. So I'm happy to be here at KCPL, and I'm happy to be here with you all today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the brief background of us uh, pursuing this process um, and the Benedum grant. Um, the process that we uh, were involved with is called ADESIS, which we're not, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about like what getting into the names of uh, all of those processes, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it worked. So um, we got involved with this process of integrating teams into our organization problem solving approach. Our organization found we were getting caught up in a cycle of having meeting after meeting with many issues on our agenda getting pushed to the next meeting. So um, one of our board members had experience with a process called ADESIS, uh, which helped streamline the organization meeting process and facilitate more pro productive meetings. Um, so the meeting process, which Teddy will talk a little bit more about later, focuses on a team approach, which includes all levels of staff throughout the organization. Um, and um, our director, when our, the board member approached our then director, decided we should move forward with the process. Um, 
And as we got into the process, um, it necessitated us applying for the Benetton grant to continue forward with our um, the second phase of the process, which was our mission action plan and implementing the process to a fuller extent. Um, so we got to a point where we were, um, you know, where we couldn't go any further until um, we applied for the grant. So we did that. Um, so we chose to focus on areas of improvement for our organization, um, which we're gonna break down in more detail later. Um, Sarah, Marsha, and Teddy will talk more about those things. Um, we decided to increase STEM programming and accessing pro patron program needs um, and kind of assessing that and seeing how, what our patrons, were we really meeting the needs of our patrons? Um, and if there were any program opportunities that we were missing. Um, we also addressed organizational processes um, related to employee satisfaction um, and wanted to increase circulation of electronic resources. And we'll talk about, like I said, all of those more in detail um, and also how COVID affected this process as well. So upon completion, uh, the Benedim wanted us to um, share our experience of this process and uh, with state at the statewide level. Um, so we're here today to share um, our experience and what we learned um, through this process. Um, and so two areas I'm gonna focus on, um, as she said, there's three main things that we need to accomplish in the grant. And one was increase our circulation by 3%. Um, so our plan for that was actually, we were going to start automatic renewals and we were gonna launch that in March of 2020. As many people know, March of 2020 is when COVID hit um, for West Virginia. And so I'm gonna talk about later how we switched our focus from automatic renewals to electronic resources. And when we talk about how we changed our process with COVID. The second thing is, is with programming. We needed to increase our numbers from 2,740 to 2,775 um, system wide programs throughout the system in a year time frame. Um, and we did this by, and they wanted us to also focus on STEM. Because part of the goal of the Benedict Grant was to focus externally and internally on our organization and seeing what we can improve. So with um, the first thing we did is we actually did a survey of our patrons. We did two different surveys. We did a survey of patrons that were already attending programs and the programs we were doing and what they thought of it. And then we did a survey of everyone saying, hey, if we don't have something you like, what would you like? How would you like it? And what location would you like it? Penny is actually going to share links. I did two I created uh, copies of our surveys that will be in a link because I use a software called Microsoft Forms, um, which is a free software that we have through our Microsoft. And so you guys can even take the survey if you wish for the two different ones. We also did provide them in paper format for both of them so that we could get a full survey results because as some people know, pe people don't take it electronically. And we did this for about a month to collect all the data. Um, the second thing we did is we focused on STEM programming. And one of the things we did is every location, um, except for our location of Glasgow and Marmette, had to do one STEM program a month. It needed to be part of their regular scheduling thing. In addition to that, we worked with collaborations. We had a project build program, which was a collaboration with the American Society of Civil Engineers. And then we also had with the West Virginia Extension Services. So we looked in our community and we started partnering with people to provide more STEM programs. Um, in addition to do this, one of the things we also did is we redid our stat sheet. And to redo our stat sheet, that was allowing other locations to see the stats of the other fellow branches so that we can share and collaborate better. But one of the biggest changes that we did is we um, started including more staff into programming. Um, KCPL has traditionally kept um, that this is a role that you're doing programming. And we expanded that into more people could do programming and we were more able to use the assets of our staff 
and presenting programming. So that was one of the major changes that we did, which came from our internal look into the organization, which is leads into Marsha's part of the internal looking. Okay, so my particular um, section of this, the Adesa Benedim grant, the initiative is addressing organizational processes related to employee satisfaction. And so this was quite an undertaking. Um, it certainly wasn't just myself um, who took on um, this particular initiative. It was completed by employees from all levels of the organization, and we also had board involvement. Um, so I think it's, it's critical that when we talk about this process that we don't get too um, down into the details of the ADESIS process. Um, that's not what this presentation is about. It's just to kind of give everyone an idea of how we are focusing on a new strategy of problem solving in our organization. But to say that, I need to give you just a little bit more details about the ADESIS process and how we came up with kind of our roadmap. Um, to what we were gonna focus on. So in October of 2018, we had our first Adiza session. And so basically this is a two day session, a two day retreat. We had 22 members um, of the KCPL staff there, all levels of the organization and a few um, members of the board. And this was a pretty action packed um, two day session, but I'm just gonna focus on um, what pertains to this particular initiative. And so during the session, the Adesis consultants, we were all in a circle around the room, had every employee that was participating and board members go around the room and give a potential improvement point. I'm going to be very careful because we refer to that as a PIP. And so I may use that interchangeably, but I'm going to try to really focus on it's a potential improvement point. This is not problems. This is not complaints. It's potential improvement points. And so as we went around the room, um, you can imagine that's probably a little uncomfortable for some people. Um, their supervisors are sitting in the room, members of the board are sitting in the room, your coworkers. Um, and so we really had to focus on an environment of being open, of being honest, of being trusting and understanding. And it, it went off really, really well. Um, so as we went around the room, um, you know, if your potential improvement point had already been mentioned by someone else, we just kept going around the room. Drum roll, please. Um, we came up with 148 potential improvement points. And yikes, I mean, that's a lot. Um, that's a lot of work. Um, that's a, a lot of things that maybe we should be doing that we weren't doing. Um, and so we had to kind of back up from that and say, okay, so what's next, right? So we have 148 um, potential improvement points. Um, so I'm, we immediately after this session started working, and as I mentioned, it was in 2018, um, we didn't apply for the next portion of this, which is the mission action plan that Ashley mentioned um, until 2019. So we had already started working on addressing potential improvement points. But the Benedim grant drew extra emphasis on that. And for this particular initiative, um, Casey Peel was asked to address 21 potential improvement points um, during the grant period. So I'm pleased to say, and it's a spoiler alert, I think Ashley's gonna talk about the statistics later, um, that we did hit 26. Um, we addressed 26 potential improvement points during the grant process. So we were successful with this initiative and we continue to focus on those potential improvement points. Um, so as you can imagine, a lot of the potential improvement points kind of fall into my wheelhouse under my umbrella as the human resources and training manager. Um, I'll share some of those with you. Um, staff dissatisfaction with monetary compensation. Um, staff dissatisfaction with non-monetary compensation such as benefits. Um, some staff lack basic training skills to do their job. Job descriptions are too limiting. And I think that's something we've worked on where Sarah's talking about allowing additional people with their talents to do programming. Um, staff morale is poor, um, which is a concern. Um, but one of the ones that jumped out to me, and Teddy's going to speak after me about the team approach, um, was that staff feel mentally and physically unsafe at work. So I'm going to repeat that staff feel mentally and physically unsafe at work. And so 
Teddy, I think, is going to talk a little bit about the patterns, but there'll be a number of PIPs that go under kind of a, a larger umbrella, and this is one. So I'll talk about some of the items and concerns that staff had related to this um, particular pattern. Um, they're concerned about their personal safety when they're at work. They're concerned that a patron is going to bring bed bugs into the facility and they're going to take those home with them. Um, they're not sure how to address, uh, properly address individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, drug deals in the library, overdoses in the library, drug use in the library, um, someone who is having a mental health crisis in the library. Um, in 2018, while we developed these PIPs, Pinal County was also going through an outbreak of hepatitis A. And so that was a big concern for our staff as well. So we had you know, a lot of potential improvement points to focus on, but some really rise to the top of urgency and seriousness. And this is one of those. And so we immediately started forming teams to address these issues. And so I'll let Teddy go ahead next with talking about how we form teams. Thanks. Um, now, as we mentioned, you know, the we will begin this process and, and while we don't wanna focus on the process, there are a lot of good things that we did take away from it. And one of them was the creation, uh, a specific process of creating the teams that we worked with. Uh, something you're gonna hear us talk about is that everyone from the organization uh, or every, someone from every level of the organization uh, is represented in these things. Uh, initially, there's a committee formed to address these potential improvement points, to look at them. And uh, as Marcia said, we'll start to pattern them. We'll see that sort of one, you know, certain sections of them fall into similar realms or, you know, like these few naturally fall into something like an HR setting or these fall into a technology setting. And so that committee will then create teams, again, picking individuals from every level within the organization. And it's very important to get that perspective because we learned a lot of things by including you know, individuals as high as the board and um, you know, individuals that are on our front lines and in our facilities. Um, so we create these teams to address patterns or groups of these potential improvement points. And we're drawing from the expertise and experience of staff at all of our levels. Uh, and that is something that is, is deeply important in creating these teams. Um, the our frontline staff, our children's staff, you know, the, the managers and the board members are all gonna have different things to bring to these, to these teams, different perspectives and often different ideas. Um, you know, among that, the safety team, we you know, included security and facilities uh, and individuals that work on the front line that can give us stories and tell us these things. So the committee is formed. They find the patterns for these potential improvement points and assign teams to look into them, to deal with them. Uh, things that can be handled quickly are, are taken care of. And it, you know, there's, there's no shame. I know that sometimes we use the, the term low hanging fruit. And I wanna remind everybody that that's not a bad thing. If it's something that we can fix right away and it's been made, you know, brought to our attention, then, then we should, we should go out there and, and pick that low hanging fruit, but in a good way. It's something that we're now aware of and we can take care of to the satisfaction um, to as many people as possible. In some cases, uh, the solution is, you know, better communication or better training, but these teams allow us to get the perspective from across the organization and then deal with these things as necessary. Um, the teams then, initially, the teams would report back to the committee on a monthly basis. But as we started really churning through these and these, some of the problems uh, became larger ones that took more time to deal with, uh, we moved to a quarterly uh, section where the teams would report back every three months to that committee that oversaw everything. And uh, in most cases, we could say that these things were addressed, whether through training or through direct action or through a plan or that something was still being worked on or that they needed more resources. And this support structure um, became really important to be able to effectively address these. Um, I think the next thing we're gonna move over into is Ashley's going to talk about, I guess, how our advance or, or how our approach had to sort of change due to the, the occurrences in the world. Um, so I'm going to talk first about the advantages of using this approach to problem solving. Um, 
So two of the biggest advantages that we uh, found through this process was, first of all, involving all levels of staff throughout the organization. So we included, there were maintenance members on teams, um, LA2s, you know, all the way up to, um, you know, um, branch managers and department heads and admin, administrative staff. So we had every level of the organization involved in um, these teams. And we found that really beneficial. Um, there were issues that were brought forth um, that, um, especially with the safety uh, team, that um, it was really beneficial to have all levels of staff on that team um, because there were items that um, administ you know, administration maybe wasn't aware of um, or that were brought to light about um, how you know, potentially serious the issue was. So um, that was an example of you know, one of the teams that really especially benefited from that. Um, but it was empowering to staff to be included in these meetings. Um, and it also gave multiple staff perspectives um, that were able to be voiced throughout the process. Um, the second thing that we found to be really beneficial um, about this team approach was um, the limited and topic specific agenda. So um, that focused on a specific issue. So um, I already mentioned the safety team. So that team only focused on safety issues. Um, so prior to this, um, agendas might include, you know, uh, topics from all over the organization. Um, and, you know, you'd get tidbits of all of these little pieces of um, different things that were happening. But with this process, um, you go in and you've got an agenda only about safety. Um, and so you're, it's a very focused um, meeting. And the way that the process works is everyone gets a seat, you know, a seat at the table. They get to speak about um, issues that they are finding um, particularly challenging or, um, and then it, you try to come up with a, um, a follow-up for that issue. So um, we found that really especially helpful to have the limited um, and topic specific agendas um, for several of our teams. And then I'm, now I'm gonna talk about the challenges um, of the project. Uh, so we had challenges pre-COVID too, um, and some of those were, um, you know, how do we get all these people in the meetings um, from all levels of the organization, system-wide, from every branch? Um, so um, that necessitated a collaboration with branch managers, um, scheduling meetings far enough in advance so that managers could arrange the schedules so staff members could attend. Um, being aware that there would be staffing, um, you know, potential staffing issues. Um, so we would try to not pull, you know, two from the same branch, uh, two people from the same branch for the same meeting, um, and just kind of being aware of that. Um, another challenge that we had was how to disseminate information to staff regarding programming goals um, and the STEM programming. So we have a team called Promar, which is our um, programming and marketing team. And a lot of our information was disseminated regarding programming through that, through those meetings and emails. Um, and I would send out updates to staff as well about our process so, um, so that people were still in, were informed. Um, and I had an open door, um, you know, if anybody had questions about, you know, what what the guidelines were or what we were working towards, they could email me and let me know. Um, but I didn't get any questions because we, we were um, effective at disseminating that information. Um, so another challenge that we found was addressing staff concerns um, related to employee satisfaction um, that were attainable. And um, so we made an attempt to glean information from staff 
to improve the number of policy to improve a number of policies and procedures. And Marsha um, did a great job emailing staff and um, trying to get information from them. Um, but we found that that Marsha found that that was a little bit challenging. Um, some issues she would get some feedback on, and other issues staff she didn't get any feedback on. So, um, so that was definitely a lesson learned for us um, about, um, you know, how to, how to get information for st from staff. Um, and I would say with COVID, we were even, staff were even less likely while we were closed for COVID to respond to those emails. So, um, another challenge we had um, was we were in the process of finding a new director. Um, so we, our previous director left right at the beginning of this project. <laughs> so we, um, we had to keep that in mind, you know, what would, what do we want for our staff? You know, what would we like our next director? You know, what goals do we want to set forth that um, we would like a director? You know, how, where do we see our organization going? Um, and so that was important as well. Um, to kind of have that forethought um, and work through the whole process um, without a director. Um, and then lastly, it was thinking through ways to increase our electronic resource usage. So, um, and involving the right staff. And that, and basically that was the key of that, involving the right staff um, in that discussion to make sure that we um, could think of potential problems or issues that would come up. Um, and then also we had the challenge of working within a year time frame. So our grant process began September of 2019 and we had through August 31, 2020. Um, so we had to think about what goals were tangible for the project. You know, what can we feasibly do within a year? Um, and as Teddy mentioned, you know, uh, some of that was the low hanging fruit, which is not a bad thing. Um, kind of figuring out what you can obtain within um, within the year time frame um, was kind of very important for us during this process. Um, so that's what I that's all I have to say about all of those our challenges, I think. So I'm going to go through the specific challenges that we changed on due to COVID. Um, because as I'm sure everyone on this call, COVID majorly affected your library and your organization. And as I brought up earlier, one of the goals was to increase circulation by 3% and our plan was to do automatic renewals. And we were going to start it the month COVID um, sent us from working from home in March. And we are still planning on starting automatic renewals at some point. But right now, due to COVID, we've extended our due dates on everything and things like that. So there is no reason to do automatic renewals right now based on the way we're handling patrons and fines currently. So what we did instead is we focused on our electronic resources as Ashley brought up. And what we did is we increased Hoopla from seven a month to 15 a month. We increased Canopy from five a month to 10 a month. We increased Frugal from five hours a day to 24 hours a day for streaming. And we looked at those resources because one of the great things about Canopy and Hoopla is you pay for only what patrons use. And so although it's a very expensive resource and I understand it's tight, but our patrons love it. And that's the thing that we really were focusing on is what can we do to serve our patrons during this time period? And so that's where our focus went. And there was an increase in our e-resources that Ashley will talk about at the end and how that switch went. And again, that does not mean we're not going to do automatic renewals. It's just not gonna be in the grant period and we probably will do it once we're out of COVID. <laughs> um, the second part was the programming. So programming, as everyone knows, when COVID hit and people will start to work from home, it was just a struggle. I mean, it was a struggle. You had to figure out what staff had what equipment at home, who had access to different things, how can they do it? And so one of the first things we did is we created the KCPL from home page, which uh, Teddy's going to share in the chat box. 
Um, and that was just focused resources that people could have and use during COVID. Um, and we use something called Weebly, um, which is a web design site that was able to give us a domain and we were able to do it pretty quickly. And a shout out to Josh from our marketing team because he's just absolutely amazing in his design of it. The next thing is we started doing virtual programming. And that was, as Ashley's on this call, she just did a session earlier on the adult book chat that she did. And that was, again, seeing what resources people had and seeing what they could do and what we can present from home. And I think staff really rose to that challenge. Um, we started, as soon as we were starting to do curbside, we started doing make and take crafts. And like we said in the beginning, the Benedim grant wanted us to focus on STEM. So one of the things we did is we worked with the West Virginia Extension Service to provide STEM kits, but also our staff tried to think of STEM kits. And they try to think of resources they already have in the building and making these make and take crafts. And one of the great things I'd like to say that we did is that instead of um, one location trying to think of new crafts each time, what we did is we created a schedule. So Cross Lanes made enough crafts for the whole system. So they made 250 crafts that was sent out to each location to hand out. And they only had to create one craft. And then St. Albans did the exact same thing. They did one craft, 250 items, and they sent it out through the whole system. So we were sharing resources and working together. Another thing that we did is we started being like, okay, where are we reaching our patrons virtually? And what we realized is that different ages, we reach patrons at different locations. I've never heard about Discord until COVID. Discord is the team platform that our team librarian uses, and we do all of our team programs through the platform called Discord. And I think that was something we're learning and where our patrons were on Facebook, how is Zoom going and things like that. And it's constantly changing, but SLC came around, Summer Library. I'm sure that's something that we all face that we try to work around. We normally work very extensively with our daycares when the daycares were closed. So how were we going to work around that? And finding a complete virtual Summer Library program. So these are just challenges we face, but I really think we just adapt and work and like we've learned so much. And the main thing is, is we've learned that this is a new way we can present programming. So we're gonna to continue to do virtual programming even past COVID because we are reaching patrons this way. So that's the main thing. And the last, one of the last things we did is we also did a virtual library card. And so that's one of those things that served both the collection part and the programming part is that we were providing virtual library cards when people could not come in through an email process. So that was a nice thing that we did. Um, and then that leads into Marsha's in which she talks about the internal things. Okay, so some of our internal focuses. So when we're, we're tasked with doing our third initiative, um, we started looking at the potential improvement points. And so some of them kind of rose to the top because of the urgency or the seriousness of them. And I'm, I'm specifically speaking about the PIP I mentioned earlier about staff feeling mentally and physically unsafe at work. Um, and then some of them, and uh, Ashley and Teddy, I, you know, when I was talking about this presentation before, I said, I hate to use the term low hanging fruit, and I hope that I don't do that. And now they've made me feel comfortable doing that, but there are some that are going to be low-hanging fruit. They're going to be um, easier or, you know, minor tidbits or communication changes, things that we can do to where staff are seeing that we're serious about this. We're following up with what we said we were going to do after the initial training um, and that we are looking to address their, their PIPs, their potential improvement points. Um, you know, some of them can be as easy as just a training. Um, you know, we had discussions in our leadership meetings to say, go back, you know, when you're having your team meetings, you know, let's talk to your staff about different things you can focus on that are some of the potential improvement points where people are saying, I'm not quite sure how to address that particular issue. So that was very helpful. Um, it did help us achieve um, the goal for the Benedim Foundation, but it also is showing staff that we do hear them. 
We do value them. Um, they do have a physical seat at the table. We are listening and we do care. And that to me, above and beyond all of this, above Adesis, above Benedim, that's the focus. That's what we need to be focusing on um, for KCPL. And so, you know, some of these PIPs, as I mentioned, just kind of address themselves. I mean, this is what you focus on now. Um, I'm not going to go into, I initially had thought I would talk about just one PIP and how we address that and what we did really well with that PIP. And I don't know that that's going to be that helpful. If we're trying to give you some tips about how to address different um, communication issues, training issues, and things in your organization, I think it's better to just kind of give you a broad overview of some of the things that I think that the organization did particularly well to address some of these PIPs. And so um, we did look at, we had people that would say, we've got politics and religion at the desk. I'm not sure how to address that. Um, you know, how do I stop those conversations or how do I de-escalate situations when that's happening? Um, we're not consistently addressing our pay, patron code of behavior. Um, clarification of how to use vacancy hours. Like those are some of what I would refer to as low hanging fruit of where we're saying, okay, so let's focus on staff training for these things that are being rolled out in team meetings with individual branches. We have a little bit of a challenge here because we have over 140 employees and we have 11 locations if you include the bookmobile. So to say we're gonna walk through a building and get someone's, you know, input every single day or once a week, I'm going to see all of the employees in the system. That's just not physically possible. And so we had to try to, even though we want people to have a seat at the table, we have to try to come up with other ways that we can reach employees. And so through training in their individual branch locations, just discussions during uh, staff meetings, um, also staff development day. Um, one of their concerns was how do we effectively um, engage and interact with individuals experiencing homelessness? And so Ryan Dowd, who actually did, was the keynote speaker um, for this conference, he was a staff development day speaker and we did a half day training with him. Um, one of the employees concerns is how do we interact in a multi-generational workforce? Um, right now we have a more diverse age group working in America than we ever have in the history of this country. Um, I don't know the statistics in the world, it could be the same, but in the United States, we have a more diverse age group. And so how do we work together um, and learn different approaches to communicate with people who are from different age groups? Um, we did mention the fall retreat that we had last fall, um, which was the mission action plan. And that's what the Benedum grant um, was for. It was specifically for us to move into that two-day session. Um, out of that two-day session, um, we came up with a long-range plan um, for three years. We came up with a vision statement, a mission statement, but we also were able to address some of these PIPs um, that are more of a philosophical or organizational priorities, um, kind of the vision of the organization. So the mission action plan accomplished a lot. Um, and we're very thankful um, that we were successful in getting this grant um, and that we had an opportunity to move to that next step of the process. One of the things we started right after the PIPs were announced, this isn't something we can count towards the Benedum grant, um, but it is something that we did as a staff newsletter. And so we're putting out a staff newsletter monthly, and this is just another form of communication that we're having. Um, you know, we can celebrate staff dates of hire and, you know, babies born and things like that. But it also has a lot of good information, um, an, an article directly every month from our library director. Um, there's an HR corner where I'll talk about different things with COVID, um, how to build a good rapport. Oh, that's a spoiler alert because that's next month. Um, how to um, build good rapport with um, patrons or customers when you're wearing a mask. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that we'll talk about um, in this staff newsletter, but it's not all serious stuff. Some of it is we are celebrating our successes. We're highlighting a branch each month um, for different things that they're doing. So the staff newsletter did come specifically out of the potential improvement points. 
Um, as I mentioned, you know, being the size of the organization where it's just impossible um, to be able to communicate with everyone directly. And so I started sending out emails. Um, once we announced the Benedum grant last fall, I started sending out emails and I would just you know, select through the name list to try to get to employees for a specific potential improvement point and asking for their feedback. And I was very deliberate in this isn't the human resources manager that's reaching out to you and wants to know, you know, like there's some kind of problem. No, this is specifically grant and ADESA's process related. And I'd love your feedback. And as Ashley mentioned, you know, we had kind of mixed um, some people would participate, some didn't, that's okay. Um, and some people would say, hmm, I'm surprised that this is an issue that someone else brought up. You know, our patrons aren't complaining about our service hours. They understand when we're open. You know, they didn't expect us to be closed on Veterans Day, for example. So um, I, I received some good feedback and some things that we were able to kind of to expand on and move forward. During COVID, I tried this and it really didn't work out very well. Um, you know, with different technology, not everyone's by their computer, um, nor do they want to respond to some of these type of questions. So we didn't get as much um, feedback on the emails that I sent out um, as I would have liked during COVID, but that's certainly understandable. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up here with a shout out to our personnel committee um, from the board. You know, one of the things I mentioned early on is that it really did take a village here. It's all levels of the organization is also our board um, that helped to achieve the goal um, of reaching 21, addressing 21 PIPs during this time period. And so our personnel committee members of our board had participated in the initial um, two-day workshop. They also participated in the mission action plan workshop, and they were very interested in their saying, Marcia, how can we help? You know, um, they're very interested in helping. And what can we do to address um, some of the staff's um, potential improvement points. So we started some large scale um, projects. Um, I took on a compensation study, um, also a performance evaluation review. Um, COVID put a halt um, because of funding um, and us just trying to re regroup on the compensation study. So that is on hold, but that's something that started that the personnel committee is very supportive of. Um, the performance evaluation revamp, um, I've talked with leadership staff about this. Um, I had I've actually got a form ready, um, but then we had a change in leadership um, here at this organization and I didn't feel it was the right time um, to start polling staff about this and to start seeing if this is a, a new form we wanna use until Erica has been given an opportunity to kind of get to know this organization and spend some time. So that's on the back burner, but it's happening. And the personnel committee is very supportive of that. Um, two things that we have put in place, um, employees were talking about um, regular pay increases. That's not been something that's happened at KCPL. It's not a guarantee in the past that every year you're gonna get a pay increase. And so um, this past winter, um, the board approved a step increase. Um, it's an employee compensation policy where KCPL employees, as long as funding is stable, um, will receive a 1.5% increase every year. Um, I hate to say it's kind of like a cost of living increase, but that's similar to what it's supposed to be. Um, employees can get additional increases as well should the board decide um, that that's a year that they're going to do additional increases. But that's something that specifically the board took action on that came from um, this process. Um, also, our holiday policy. Um, and we took a unique approach to this. Um, we re So the first, we were given two additional holidays um, by the board. The first is the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, we were typically open. Um, based on our statistics, um, we've decided that it's, it's better if we just close for that day. We don't have a lot of people in the building. Um, and so that's another holiday that the board approved. The unique approach we had is that we were very interested in observing Martin Luther King Jr. Day. However, that's a big programming day for us. And we have a lot of people in the library. And so the board was trying to come up with a way to observe that holiday without us being closed. And what they decided to do is to give a floating holiday. And so we will be open. This will be our first year that we do it this, this January in the 2021. Um, we will be open. 
Um, but as long as it's operationally feasible, employees can ask to use their floating holiday that day, or they can use it sometime that week or the week before. So we're still acknowledging and observing the holiday, but we're not closing the library to do that. So I felt like that was a great um, approach uh, for the board to take to be able to recognize that, but again, still provide service on that day. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it for my section. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley. She's gonna talk a little bit about our results, kind of the numbers, and then she's gonna lead us into the summary. Okay, yeah, and I was gonna also um, add a positive um, success, I guess one of the things that we, that came out of this process um, as an example of kind of something getting, moving ahead faster than it normally would have. Um, and that was an initiative that we were interested in, which was to provide um, community um, services to our patrons. And so, um, it kind of was serendipitous, I guess. Um, I found out that Catholic Charities in Charleston was interested in partnering specifically with the library um, to offer community support services. And we have been interested in this as well. So um, they would provide the services without religious promotion or requirement. So we were interested in pursuing it. Um, and what it resulted in was um, they were able to provide services for a wide range of situations, including homelessness, um, emergency crisis resources for utility bills, um, legal support, veteran services, food and clothing resources, and um, helping people with eviction um, questions and process. So um, that was something that we were really interested in. And it started about a month before COVID, month and a half before COVID. Um, we were able to, um, from start to finish, I think it got approved within and started within a month. Um, and so uh, we, we acted very quickly on it through this process and um, were able to get them in really soon and get it started. And we were seeing people come to visit um, the community support services before COVID happened. So we hope that'll be something we can resume once COVID is over. Um, so I wanted to, to mention that as a process that was, we were able to get that moved through the line a little bit more quickly than we normally would have. Um, now to results. So this is the numbers part, um, which I like numbers. I know not everyone does, but <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm not going to make it boring. I'm going to talk just a little bit about, um, so we were tasked with increasing programming by 3%. Um, while COVID definitely impacted that process, um, we were able to take programming, of course, to the next level with our online program that Sarah talked about. Um, and just increasing as much as we could online programming through those various platforms. And combined um, for the last, so from through this year, we've had a combined of 21,680 in-person and virtual program attendees. So, um, and a lot of that is virtual attendees. Um, some, I can't remember which month it was, but we had around 6,000 people um, and one of the months that attended virtually. So it's been really successful us moving to um, meeting the needs of our patrons through virtual programming. We also um, were interested in increasing STEM programming. So we increased um, STEM programming to at least one STEM program per branch per month. So each branch would do a STEM program per month. Um, and that was really successful. And we were getting great feedback about that. Um, and they're still, like Sarah said, they're still continuing to do um, take, you know, make and take kits and things like that. So we're, we're continuing um, to focus on that STEM programming, even through COVID. Um, we did this, the survey um, to assess our patrons' needs. Um, we did an online survey, we made it available online, and we also did a paper format because we didn't want to leave anyone out who wanted to participate. So we did both formats, and we had 342 patron responses, um, 
which we were happy with. We felt like that was a pretty decent um, response. And then um, we left it open for the month, for one month. And what we found through that is that people were interested in GED and task related programs, um, as well as cooking and nutrition programs. So um, because of COVID, we haven't been able to implement those yet. We were in the process, our adult program, programming librarian was working on that. Um, but that is something that we know we will um, post COVID, hopefully uh, continue in the future um, to offer. Um, Marcia talked a lot about the PIPs, so I'm just going to reiterate that we were um, we were tasked to address 21 of the PIPs, and we're able to address 26 of those. Um, and as we've talked about several times, um, some of that was the low hanging fruit. And so I would say to your organization that that is a is a good approach. Um, what can you um, do without you know? I mean. Is it as simple as having a meeting with your branch managers to address an issue um, with staff? Um, so we were able to address 26. Um, so we exceeded that number of 21. And um, as I've talked about, during COVID, we were uh, able to increase um, the minimum amount borrowed. It wasn't really, um, so what we did was Hoopla, I think Sarah mentioned this, Hoopla we increased um, from seven to 15 a month, Canopy five to 10 a month, Freegal went from five hours a day to 24 hour day streaming. Um, and we added Scholastic Teachables um, to aid with school age children's virtual and in learning, in person learning. Um, we did see database usage drop during COVID by 22%. Um, but overall, combined with the entertainment-oriented electronic resources, um, we saw an overall electronic usage uh, rise 38% during COVID. So we had a lot of people accessing those electronic resources, especially the entertainment-based ones, um, eBooks, Canopy, Hoopla, all of those things during COVID. Um, and then, for, um, so what I'll do is move into the summary now. And Marsha is gonna do part of the summary and I'm gonna do the other part. I'm gonna let her start off and then she'll pass it back off to me. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Marsha. Okay, thank you. And I'll try to quickly go through this because I know we're getting short on time and we wanna be available if there's questions. Um, really the point of the summary is just to kind of go through quickly um, what we've learned from this. And so even with the curveball that COVID has thrown our way this year, we still continued to focus and address um, our, our three specific programming, circulation, and employee satisfaction for the Benedum grant. And it, it was difficult, but we we all have things in our organizations that come up. There's never a perfect year. Um, there's going to be staffing issues. There's going to be, um, you know, there could be funding issues, competing priorities. So just to kind of keep your eye on the prize and to focus on smaller tasks of, of how you can take on something like this was good for me. Um, I consider myself a problem solver. So to say I'm going to problem solve and I'm going to fix or I'm going to correct 148 potential improvement points in the system is impossible. And so the thought of just Jesus using the word addressing, we're addressing them. And to know that there's going to be a cascade of what happens, you can address some of these smaller items, low hanging fruit, and they may indirectly impact larger issues um, in the system. And so I think that's something really important to focus on that just because this may seem like a simple training tip um, that you're giving for employees, it may help them feel safer in the workplace. Um, you know, there may be things that you're doing that you think seem pretty small um, that are making a large impact. Um, all PIPs are not created equal. So when we said we've got 148 of these and how are we gonna start addressing them, um, that's, it's not just we start at number one and go to number 148. It's looking at urgent PIPs. It's looking at things that we can address that we hope have a cascading impact um, on other employee concerns. Um, I talked about it, even minor um, improvements can go a long way and listen to your staff and get their input directly. Um, I felt like I was doing a pretty good job as an individual of getting staff input because it's critical for me. 
But what I did not realize is that staff didn't feel necessarily heard from me because the information they were giving to me was filtered through their manager. And so I think having a seat at the table or having opportunities to email directly with me about a specific PIP um, has been helpful. Um, I will say, I think this process has helped overall communication in the system, but I don't think that every single employee would say they agree. Um, we didn't have 140 employees that were involved in teams because it's just, it's, it's impossible to do that. And we haven't went a long enough time in this process to start filtering people in and out of these teams. Um, so I think there's some individuals that still feel like they didn't have as much information because they didn't have a seat at the table or they were not directly part of um, this process. You know, they were, and that's why I try to get people involved with emails but again, um, you know, it's not, it's not perfect. And that's the other thing I'll mention, you know, you can't expect perfection. This organization is never gonna get to a level of communication that everyone says it's nirvana. This is where we wanna be. Um, we're never gonna get to a point that staff morale is perfect. Um, but we keep, uh, we keep striving for that. Um, if there's one day that we say everything's just great, there's nothing else for, this, for us to do, well, that's a fail. That, that's not how we should be approaching this. So I do think continuing to move forward um, and trying to reinvent yourself. This process has given us a roadmap um, of where we need to go. Um, it has given us the navigation tools of how to get there. Um, and so we just need to continue to move forward with it. Ashley, I'll let you wrap up your portion. So I'll keep it short because I know we are running short on time, um, but I wanted to um, kind of summarize again our virtual programming platforms that we used. Um, they were all free. Um, we used Facebook for the virtual book chat, Facebook Live for children's programs, story time. And we have a what we call a self-care Saturday um, group that um, they would do maybe makeup tutorials or how to make a whipped coffee. I mean, these just these short little videos um, that we had a lot of interest in. And that was done on Facebook Live. And then as Sarah mentioned, Discord, um, our teen librarian has been using that a lot for the uh, virtual D&D &D and movie nights. So, um, and he's had really good success with getting teens involved through Discord. Um, and then we, I would say utilizing the skills of the staff. So with COVID, we kind of had to look at getting other staff involved. Um, I had uh, involved in LA2 um, and a children's specialist actually with my virtual book chat. Um, and it was a group effort um, with that because um, it helps to have more than one person doing that. We also had, um, the Self-Care Saturdays, their adult programming librarian had an LA2 from one of the branches that was helping out. Um, so we've had, even our executive administrative assistant has done like uh, a book talk. So we've had all levels of folks who've gotten involved with some, some programming with our virtual programming. Um, because as Marsha said, it takes a village, to, you know, to do all of this. Um, and we, if we left it to only our true programming folks, it, it would be a lot of work for them to do all of that by themselves. Um, and then I would say with your e-resource collection, um, just evaluate the ways that you can meet those needs. You know, maybe um, you have e-resources that aren't being used um, and you could use that money towards something that would be more beneficial um, to your patrons. Um, and all libraries have, you know, budget constraints. But that's one thing that we looked at too was, you know, are these being used? And some of them weren't. Um, and um, so we've done some of that, as well as, um, you know, promotion and highlighting online resources. Um, on Facebook, letting our patrons know what we have available because sometimes patrons don't even know that you have something available. So it's important to let patrons know what e-resources you do have. Um, or if somebody comes in looking for a book, which happens to me a lot in reference, 
we don't have a physical copy, but check the e-resources. Maybe you have an e-resource copy and then people get used to using that and they really enjoy it. Um, especially with COVID, we have a lot of people who've gone almost entirely to e-resource um, because they don't want to get out much or can't get out much. So um, I would say that those are things to think about. We've really enjoyed having you guys join us for this. Um, and we're now gonna take some questions. Um, I think Teddy's been putting some links uh, in the chat for folks with some of their questions, but I don't know if we have other ones that we haven't yet answered. So the, the two questions we've had come up so far, the first one was about the Benham grant. Uh, I have put the link for that in the description is the Claude Worthington Benham Foundation. The question was, was this a one-time thing or do they regularly give grants? Um, Ashley, do you want to expand on that anymore? I've put the link in it. Sure. Um, yeah, Benedim, for those of you who don't know about the Benedim Foundation, the, the Benedims were from West Virginia originally. Um, and Claude Benedim um, became a, a very wealthy entrepreneur. Um, and he lived in Pittsburgh, but upon his passing and his wife's passing, they created a foundation um, to give money back to the community. Um, and most of that money goes to either Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh area, or to West Virginia. They wanted their home state to um, benefit from, um, from how wealthy they had been. Uh, they wanted to give back to the community. So it's an, it's a, amazing foundation. They have um, great staff and they were really great to work with um, and they have lots of opportunities for grants um, and give a, give a lot of money back to West Virginia. So I would encourage um, checking them out um, and, and seeing if there's potentially something that would be um, applicable to your organization. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, our next question was about our newsletter. They were interested in a format. I've shared a copy of our October newsletter, but um, Sarah or Marsha, would either one of you like to talk about how we use Library Aware and, and for our newsletter? Um, I can talk about Library Aware for a second. Library Aware is a software that we have system-wide, and one of the reasons we have it is um, it is, allows all the branches to make posters and flyers as they need to and kind of keep the same formatting or general guidelines so that our marketing is consistent throughout the system. We do also have a marketing team that produces them, but this is to take some of the load off them and also if you have a last minute thing. So we then used it also for our staff newsletter, which um, again was one of the teams created. And the staff newsletter was just a combination of information that is positive information or um, just things that people needed to know. Marsha has a column in there if she wants to talk about like just her column part on it. That's okay, yeah. Um, so the HR column, I will sometimes talk about continuing the education credits um, because I'm responsible for the training um, piece here and education of staff here. Um, I've talked about flu shots where you can get flu shots. Um, as I mentioned, the spoiler alert was for next month's article. Um, and this was not my original creation, but it's um, an article about how to um, communicate better or how to have um, a good conversation with someone while wearing a mask. Um, and so just, we try to do some things like that that are useful information. Uh, we talk about open enrollment and of course, things like that that are related to human resources, but we do talk about things with flu shots, um, how to better communicate, um, wearing masks and just different topics um, of things that staff have brought up. So I, I think it, it seems to be well received. Um, haven't heard any complaints about it. I, I can't swear that everybody's reading it. Um, but I know that um, we put a lot of time and effort into trying to get this right. There was a team that was put together when we initially put this, um, the newsletter out. Um, and that team is still involved if they get any kind of, we were not meeting regularly, but if we get any kind of um, feedback from staff, we'll all share that. And we have made some minor tweaks early on to the newsletter. Um, but it seems to be well received. And it's, it's a simple kind of process of having a lot of people 
put in their information. It's not one, you know how sometimes it's one person or two people that get stuck doing all of the work for this. We really have it. Library Aware's made it easier to kind of upload that information and to share it. I did see that Beth um, Anderson had commented that the Benedum uh, Foundation had funded their back room in the late 90s. So I think that's just another example um, of, of the good things that they're doing in West Virginia. And I'd like to, to comment that you know the newsletter is just one form of engagement that we're using internally. Uh, if you read that newsletter, it also mentions a television program called More Than Books that we're doing in conjunction with the Library Commission's television network. And that focuses a lot on communication with our, our public and our community. Any other questions? Uh, that's what I've gathered from chat. If you've got any others, we'll be happy to address them. And thank you for sticking with us. I understand we're over on time, so thank you for that. Thank you all for presenting. That was a very interesting uh, session. Um, if you have any questions uh, after this, please send them to the KCPL group and hopefully they can give you additional information.